If you want this podcast free of ads, follow us now on patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by ACAST. How are you doing there? It is podcast time. It's an auspicious week for the literati, John. It is? I was down in Sandy Cove over the weekend. Swimming? No, I don't. I, don't, I hate the swimming. <laughs> I thought you'd be down there with the dry robe and the whole lot. Could you imagine? With all the others. You, with all the, the, the dry it's robes. It's a big rave at the minute. It is. This part of the world is just infested with people in their dry robes, <laughs> right? Dry robes, yeah. What I actually quite like, though, is the swimming snobbery, the hierarchy of swimmers. So those who have been, and we know one or two of them, who have been getting yeah. into the drink for many, many years, looking down their gnarled noses at the new dry robbers, and there's all sorts of swimming envy. There are records broken every day. Yeah. You know, the other way I... This is packed every morning. Every you know way, morning. Do you know the way you hear them saying, oh, it was, it was beautiful, it was four degrees, you know? Yeah. Like, imagine I came back from five-a-side soccer every night and said, oh, it was great, like I scored a hat-trick. <laughs> Nobody wants to know. <laughs> I don't give a shite if you swim all the time. But I was down there, right? Yeah. Just, not swimming. Yeah. Just want to make that clear. You were not Imagine, swimming. like, you know, yeah, yeah, I played the front, the front lad offside four times. <laughs> I don't care. Go on, what were you doing at Sunday? Coast? I was down in the Joyce Tower, Johnny. I was oh, down yeah. in the Joyce Tower because tomorrow is the 100th anniversary of the publication. Oh, is it tomorrow? Ulysses. Right. Tomorrow. And of course, I was down sniffing around incognito to the extent that you can be incognito in this neck of the woods. I was looking out to sea, thinking, extraordinary achievement writing a book like that. At that stage, in a crazy life, in his crazy life. And of course, it opens up in the tower. Yeah. Where Stephen Dedalus is contemplating going for a swim with Book Mulligan. And in Book, their dry robes. In their, no, no, exactly. No, in their <laughs> pants. In their pants. And they're quoting the Greeks, Thalassa, Thalassa, the sea, the sea, which comes from a Greek parable. Or a Greek thing. And amazingly, the Greeks, did you know the Greeks referred to the sea's colour as being purple? It was a royal purple or was they it? They had no word for blue. Really? Isn't that amazing? They referred to the sea as being purple. And of course, Joyce referred to it as being snot green. Yeah. But it was interesting. I tell you, I was doing that. and then I was which, doing... It, which it is, by the way, in Dublin Bay on some occasions. It is snot green due to the skyline, though. Due yes. To the sky, yeah, yeah, yeah. not due to the effluent in said well, back sea. in our day when we used to swim in the 70s and 80s in Sea Point, there was raw sewage. There was. There was. Flying into know, the place. The big pipe at the back just yeah. spewing it out. But no, I was telling you what I was reading. I was reading this morning and this is why I was down there. I was reading and I don't usually read this but it's an amazing read. The yeah. New York Review of Books, right? It's an extraordinary read, right? Right. And Anne Enright, yes. the Booker Prize winner, has a beautiful little piece called Dubliners on Joyce. It's really well worth reading. And she's talking about reading Joyce. She's talking about Ulysses, the difficulties, the way it was written, the whole, whole thing. And today we're going to talk about public transport. And I want to talk about Bloom and public transport. All right. I was wondering what's the leap there. This is the leap. This is is the the leap. leap. But I tell you, I've written an essay for a book that's going to be published quite soon called The Book About Everything which I think is 14 essays on Joyce oh. and Ulysses and about the book. It's I remember you writing that. Yeah. yeah, I look forward to that. Actually. And what I'm writing about it is on the economics of Bloom, right? So I got deep, deep into the economics of Bloom. And what is fantastic and fascinating is that when you read it, you see that this was a guy who was obsessed by lots of things. But one thing he was obsessed by was public transport. And in the very, very opening lines of Calypso, which is the chapter that we are introduced to Bloom. Yeah. He's walking out of his house in Eccles Street and he's walking up the road on Eccles Street and he's going into, he's thinking, he's surveying the street, the North Circular Road, and there's a pub called Macaulay's, right? Yeah. And there used to be a pub called The Big Tree. 
know that pub on Dorset Street? Right. So that's yeah. where he's talking about. But he's talking about Dublin Metropolitan Transport are going to introduce a new tram line into that area of Dorset Street. Oh, ah, right, okay. And what he says in his calculation, he goes, the value of that is going to go up like a shot, that bar. So this is the first, the very, very first incarnation of Bloom is him making a calculation about the increase in property prices in Dorset Street as a result of the public investment yeah. in the Metropolitan Railway Line. So what he's doing in his head, he's saying, there's going to be public investment, but the people who are going to benefit from that are the private owners of the big tree pub this in is, Dorset Street. And this is something that you spoke about before with Henry George, wasn't Precisely. it? Precisely. Yeah, so yeah. this is Joyce writing. The reason that the editors are calling this book the book about everything is because there is everything in Ulysses, yeah. right? So there's, it's inconceivable that Joyce writing Ulysses between like, about 1912 and 1920, was unaware of the writings of Henry George because the book Poverty and Progress that Henry George wrote was the biggest selling book in the world, with the exception of the Bible no in way. the 1890s, right? So Joyce would have been aware of this work, yeah, right? Yeah. And of course, Joyce was a big fan of Tolstoy and Tolstoy was a massive fan of George. Joyce was a, a fan of and a contemporary of George Bernard Shaw, and he was a big fan of George. And George's idea was all this about the site value tax yes. that we still talk about now. And then what you see is Bloom is thinking about the site value tax in the very first iteration <laughs> of the whole thing. And we haven't moved on from that. And actually. we haven't moved on. And we're going to talk today about public transport and the need for free public transport. But what you see in this thread going through Bloom's economics is an amazing understanding of the public realm, of public transport, of the public water. He was a big man for the public water. Yeah. And he's obsessed by the velocity of the water coming from Pula Fuca yeah. all the way down <laughs> yeah. into the sewers of Dublin, right? This is the everyman concerns of the everyman, right? And that's what makes him such an so, exceptionally interesting character. So was Joyce, like, how much of an economist was Joyce? Was it just a passing interest and a passing understanding, or does he have a, a much more deep really, appreciation? I of it? think he has, through the character Bloom, a profound understanding of economics, mm. and that wouldn't be unusual given that he understood everything. I mean, this, this is a guy who spoke nine languages. This yeah, is a guy who yeah, learned yeah. Norwegian in order to read Ibsen in the original. This is a huge intellectual, right? Politics, art, history. I mean, the history in Ulysses, the points of references are phenomenal. It would be inconceivable to think he didn't understand economics and didn't have a very strong view. Now, yeah. the interesting thing is, uh, and I'm, we're still working on this, is that the left socialists have claimed that Joyce was a socialist because once he said, I'm kind of like a socialist, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But the Bloom's economics are very free market, right? And they are very, what would be called capitalists, but they're actually very liberal in the old fashioned way. So if Bloom is channeling Joyce's feelings about the world, which it was about sex and all sorts of things, yeah, right? Yeah. And the imagination and all that sort of stuff. The economics that he's channeling are the economics of a liberal, not a lefty. Right. And that's quite interesting, the whole thing. So, so, and they'd be more of the economics of George, you know rather than the economics of Marx at the time. So George was this idea that land is the problem and land is something that we should tax. And if we tax land, we will make progress. The, the idea that what he couldn't understand is how come there was so much progress in the world in the late 19th century, so electricity yeah, and railroads, yeah. and yet there was still this enormous amount of poverty. How could we reconcile these two things yeah. together? And his idea was that the problem was land. Bloom is onto the same thing. And in the very, very opening chapters, or the opening sentences yeah. where we're introduced to Bloom, he's thinking exactly the same way. That I find really fascinating. 
Wow. And it sets us up nicely for our discussion today, John. Well, talk to me about transport. I will talk to you and, about... And that. free transport. And that. free, free everything. <laughs> and an actual Anything fact... Anything free is and, good. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, there is a lot. There's a big bloom thing. Like, free this and free this and free everything else. So we're talking about free transport, free public transport, and why it's absolutely essential. We are channeling our inner connection, <laughs> traveling back in time to Dorset Street, 1904. Ah, Dublin in the rare old times. I'm telling you now, me old Shagosha. <laughs> or as my father used to say, how are you? Remember they used to say, how's the heart? Instead of saying, how are your horse? Or right. how are your head? How's ah, the heart. <laughs> this is just a great Dublin expression. <laughs> I never heard that before. It's a great one. The heart, or me old Shagosha. Yeah. <laughs> for the non-Irish listeners, we are sorry for defaulting into our own patois. But now that the great pandemic is dull and dusted. Has been designated as over. Yes. Yeah. And everyone's getting back to work. I don't know if you've noticed, but the traffic has... It's gone up know, again. And it's chock-a-block and at all times of days and stuff. So you want to talk about transport. Well, what I want to talk about, John, is two things, right? One is that driving around in cars is totally inconsistent now with our climate change obligations, right? Yeah. Driving around burning fossil fuels out of the back of cars with engines with one person in them is totally inconsistent with trying to actually save the planet, number one. And number two, cars use far too much space. So the issue of congestion is an issue of who gets to own the space in the yeah. public realm. Yeah. This is back to our friend, Bloom. The public realm, okay? Yeah. Who gets to own the space? Is it bicycles? Is it pedestrians? Is it cars? Is it buses? Is it public transport? Is it private transport? So th if you think about it, number one is we need to move more people onto public transport and away from private cars yeah. in order to achieve climate change targets, number one. Yeah. Number two, if you're sitting in a car in traffic, it's really bad for your health. It's bad for obesity. It's bad for mobility. It also elbows out other forms of getting to work, cycling, walking, all that sort of yeah. stuff. You do get and to listen to a podcast, though. I you do get to listen to a podcast. You can do that. You can do that. You can do that while you're strolling. Yeah, yeah. You can do that while you're strolling. Yeah. So the idea here is, what is the future of metropolitan transport? What is the future of urban transport? It clearly is not more cars. What it is is shifting people's behavior. And then how do you change people's behavior? You change people's behavior by making it worthwhile to shift. Like, yeah. There's no point saying, you know, virtue signaling saying, oh, if, you, if you're on a bicycle or if you're walking, you're a better type of human being. It's like, yeah, whatever. There are some people who get encouraged by that. Yeah, yeah. But the vast majority will actually be saying, am I rewarded for changing my behavior? from moving from the car to the bus. But isn't that what they're trying to do at the moment with the, you know, all the incentives and grants and stuff for electric cars? But electric cars are still cars. You've still got congestion. Yeah. Yeah, this you, is the, the electric cars are not the future of metropolitan transport. Public transport is the future of moving large amounts of people yeah. in a carbon efficient manner from A to B, yeah. right? That means more people in whatever jalopy, whether it's a bus or a truck or whatever, right? So you think, how do you change behavior? You reward people. And we know, for example, that human behavior is interesting, that we are much more likely to change our behavior if we're rewarded rather than if we're punished, which is the same thing with kids. Like you see that in, in school. Like if you encourage a child, you'll get much better resor course, results than if course. you punish a child, yeah. right? And adults are the same collectively. This is what, you know, Eric Lonergan, who you know, very Indeed, savvy yeah. economist, calls EPIC. He talks about extreme positive incentives for change. That if you want to change people's behavior, you have to put in extremely positive incentives for change. And then what you will do is people will change willingly. Mm. Then you look at the incentive. The best incentive to use is the price structure. Yes. You jack up prices. Well, I was going to say, so what are these? What's extreme yeah, so, about So about if you that? jack up prices for certain, for example, using cars, Right. Yeah. To a certain extent, people will change their behavior. 
And if you force down prices for using public transport, people will change their behavior. Yeah. So what I would like to do, and I'd like to see in Ireland, but also in all metropolitan areas, right? No matter where you are, all urban areas where yeah. you have dense populations and people moving at certain times. What I'd really like to see is a two-pronged approach, right? Where you penalize car use, but at the same time you encourage people to use public transport. That's the first one. Yeah. And the second yes, is you Yes, they make, do have to go yeah, hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, and you make all public transport free. Just make it all free. And we can do the maths, we can do the whole thing, but let me talk about mm, road pricing. Okay. Yeah. So road pricing is the first idea, right? Yeah. That the problem is not the amount of cars on the road, it's the amount of cars at a certain time on the road. Because the road is only a fixed sure, sure. resource. It can't get bigger, it can't yeah. get smaller. And the road is a fixed supply. So the idea is that if you want to change behavior and have less cars on the road at peak time, right? At commuting time, yeah. at rush hour, what you do, because it's only rush hour for cars, it's not rush hour for anybody else. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So what you do, and there's only congestion for cars. Like, you know, when people say, oh, you know, the M50 is clogged up or Dawson Street's clogged up, it's only clogged up for cars, not for anybody else. Right? Yeah, yeah. So what you do is you, you say, we are going to use road pricing. And that road pricing is going to penalize people for driving on the roads at times when the demand is incredibly high. So between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m., for example. And how you do that is you have a little app, a road pricing app, yeah. right? And you make it really punitive to drive at those times, right? And what you're trying to do is not penalize the drivers, but you're trying to open up space for public transport. Because the problem with public transport in Dublin and all over Ireland, urban Ireland, is that the buses have to compete with cars for road space. Yeah. So they end up getting caught in the traffic too, despite the fact that we have bus lanes. We just don't have enough clear ways for buses to go on. So ultimately, what people want to do is they want to get the bus, but they want to be kind of precise about how long is it going to take me to get from A to B. Yeah. Right? Oh, well, that's crucial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're going you, to a meeting. You're going to yeah, you're going, whatever. You you're know. going to be in work, for example, yeah. right? Now, so how can you make the bus system work really efficiently? You get rid of the cars that actually clog up the buses. Yeah. And you can then make a fairly good judgment of how you, how long it's going to take, right? That's the first thing. So how do you can do Can I just it? stop you there? Yeah. Because, you know, obviously it's a blanket charge in the same way as they do a kind of congestion charge of yeah, £15 pounds in a day yeah, no, it's in expensive. London. But, but, you know, there are people who actually, you need to transport goods and... Yeah, but you would, you would exclude those. And all that those. kind of stuff around. You'd exclude those. You're like, what, what you would do is, for example, all deliveries to any retail yeah. have to be made in the middle of the night, which is the case in Holland. Okay, right? yeah. So you don't get trucks stuck at nine in the morning offloading stuff up on the curb. That's You just can't do that in Holland. It's illegal. Right. So you get all the deliveries... Are, do they? And yeah, they're yeah, just yeah. only you, you, you don't see delivery trucks in... No, never, never in Amsterdam. And it's a road pricing okay. idea. They say, okay, the roads are open at this hour of the night. There's no other traffic. This is when you do it. Yeah. But what it does is it cleans up the road. Yeah, yeah, there of is course. Yeah. So what you would do is, I think the congestion charge is kind of blunt. I think now we have technology that the charges can vary all the time. And then what you could do is you could say, look, it's going to cost you 15 quid to drive into Dublin at quarter past eight. Yeah. But there's a bus that goes from outside your house, close to your house, that'll get you in and this is going to cost you nothing. Yeah. And then people will automatically recalibrate. So there'll be a, a traffic app. So if you want to use your car, you pay. And you make those charges really quite high in order to change behavior. And this is the future. This is going to happen anyway. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not like this is what's happening in, in all sophisticated cities. And it's a bit like the toll on the M50. You know, if you drive through that bridge, yes. you yeah, get yeah, charged. Yeah. 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 Right? And the charge just simply, you know, gives you a little little text on your phone and it, you, you get charged Away directly you from yeah. your bank account, right? So that same idea that you that the, the city would be a living organism. And if you want to use your car, that's all fine, but you're going to pay a little bit more at certain times. And then people will say, well, yeah, okay, that's fine. But public transport needs to be improved dramatically. Exactly, okay? yeah. Because most people will say, I'd love to get the bus, but there isn't a bus, et cetera, right? Yeah. Now, if you actually look at the data... Most people are quite close to bus routes. Yeah. But we've just defaulted to that position that, you know, the, the system isn't good. Well, you know, you can always set up new bus routes and stuff yeah. as well. So what I'm saying is you make it expensive to drive so people think twice about rush hour. 
And the greatest one is people taking their kids to school. Yeah. This is the most ridiculous thing, driving children to school. When when we were kids, nobody drove to school. Well, yes. And nobody. Then, but, but then we used to always slag off our parents because they used to say the same thing, except they'd say they, they went in their bare feet. Oh, yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, bare feet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the idea was that urban traffic is now predominantly, suburban traffic is mm. predominantly around school runs. Yeah. Right? Ridiculous sort of idea. So you make that very, very expensive. But then by the same token, if you make buses, trams and trains free, it completely changes people's perceptions. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is there has been an explosion in public transport use in Ireland. This is the first thing. That, was there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I'll, I'll give you the numbers. They're, they're really quite amazing. Before you even make it free, right? I'll give you the numbers, right? Okay, so these figures are from 2019 because 2020 we had the pandemic and nobody yeah, said, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But there was a total of 294 million journeys made on state-funded transport services, right? That was a 9% increase on the year before and an incredible 40% increase over 2012. Wow. So there's a huge take-up in tra public transport and buses in the main. But, but what, what's driving that? What it's driving that is people don't want to be in traffic anymore. People don't want to be in traffic anymore, right? But it's a, So it's a 40% change in less than a decade. Right. That is phenomenal, right? Two-thirds of these journeys were on bus, Rail service was 17%, and light rail, like Lewis's and, mm. and, and Dart's, were 16%. The Lewis, obviously, very, very strong, huge growth because there's a new line put in, okay? Yeah. But regionally, Dublin accounts for 83% of all passenger numbers, right? Which is kind of huge. Cork is around only 6%. So it shows you how huge wow. Dublin And the rest of the country is 11%. Yeah. So it's Dublin bus is the main transport yeah. hub of, of this whole country, right? And when you think about it, right, Dublin bus services are carrying more than half of all passengers in Ireland, which, which, is, which is phenomenal. But the growth rate is significant. So people are taking public transport much more, right? And then the question is, how much more would they take it if it was free? Right? Yeah. If all public transport was free, and this is where the discussion becomes really interesting. So if you look at all public transport in Ireland costs 660 million euros a year. Yeah. That's the amount of revenue raised from fares. So that's the amount of revenue you'd lose. Right. So the question is then, okay, could you make public transport free? Is it plausible? Is it logical? Right. So you're talking 660 million. 660 million is actually very, very little. And I'll tell you why. Go on. What we would do is we would go to the bond market, back to our friend, the bond yeah. market, right? So the bond market right. is the answer to everything. Well, it's the answer to all public investment. So right now, even after all the jitters of the last week or two, the Irish government 30-year bond yield yeah. is 0 0.88. So it's less than 1%. Right? right, okay. So less than 1%. Well, 0 0.088, right? So less than 1%, right? So that means the Irish government can borrow for less than 1%. That means if you were to borrow money in the bond market, like raising a green transport bond, for mm. example, to pay for the shortfall in revenue that would be the consequence of making all public transport free in the whole country. Yeah. In the whole country. The bill every year to service that bond would be 6 Point six million euros, maybe less, because it's less wow. than one percent. That's nothing. That, that's that, that a, is nothing. Yeah, that's what a big pub makes here. Yeah, right. Didn't they spend that in a the printer there recently? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So think about it. So six point six million euros. That's how much it costs yeah. every year if you were to use the bond market. Now the reason you use the bond market is you could issue a perpetual bond, or you could issue a one hundred year bond. So Austria which is the same credit rating as us, yeah. issued a 100-year bond in order to pay for stuff, right? Right. The great example of using the 100-year bond is the Brits and the First World What's War. What's the percentage on that? About 1%. So it's the same, year, right, yeah, yeah, okay. it's kind of, And the reason it's the same is because the bond yield is only, we talked about this last week, the short-term interest rate plus a risk premium. Yeah. And the markets have thought the risk is very, very low. We're going to have inflation, low inflation for the next whatever. Well, 100 years. 
Well, are we? Because it, does, are, it is, doesn't matter if that's the price they they said we have. But if inflation is on the rise now, it's seven percent in the US. Yeah, but it hasn't it hasn't it hasn't fed into bond yields because the central banks are still keeping interest rates very very low, right? And the reason there are investors who are prepared to buy these yeah. assets at this rate is because very large insurance companies, for example, need to match their assets and liabilities. Yeah. And what they want is something that they know is going to pay them even 1% per year. Because right. deposit rates are minus 1%. Right. Right? So what you have is a crazy... It's an amazing thing to think about. It. Interest rates are as low now as they have been in 500 years. Right. 500 okay. years. Wow. Okay. okay. So we want to do something really good, which is reduce our carbon footprint and free up clogged roads from too many cars. Yeah. We know that making transport free will totally encourage a huge amount of people who never took it before because it's free, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also know that using the bond market, it would cost us 6.6 .6 million euros a year to provide public transport for the entire country by borrowing for 100 years or even 30 years, right? Yeah, yeah. We don't have a 100-year note. We've never, we've never issued one, but we could, right? But even if we do 30 years, yeah. right? So the actual financial costs are tiny and the transformational social achievements and social advantages are enormous. More cycling, more pedestrians, more public transport on buses that we know precisely can get from A to B at a certain time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's where you expand. Element of it. So you expand the service dramatically. The roads are free of cars. So what you do is you have the roads that are free. So the bus journeys, it's not stop, start, stop, start, start, stop. You're going from A to B. You have momentum. You have movement. Yeah. But, and actually, I think a, a really interesting issue, John, and we rarely talk about it, is the social upside of having people from different backgrounds and different income levels getting public transport themselves. I have, a, I have a Swedish friend of mine who said to me ages ago about Stockholm, he said, you know what the sign of a really proper country is? That everyone goes out on a Saturday night on public transport and comes home together. Yeah. On the train or on the tram. He said, that for me is a sign of sophistication. He said, a sign of retardation is everyone in Ubers and everyone in taxis and everybody in, you know, private cars. Yeah, said, little that, bubbles, their own little that, bubbles. Yeah. And I think the social interaction, coming back to our friend Bloom, mm. Bloom's whole thing was we're going to walk around Dublin and meet all sorts, nationalists, you know, unionists, rich people, poor people, the public realm. And transport is part of the public realm. Well, I always remember my elderly aunt, Joan, who you mm. remember, never drove in her life. But, you know, when she got the the Charlie Hoy free bus pass, yeah. she used to, you know, just for a day out, a bit of diversion. Out, yeah. But she'd head down to Galway yeah. on the train. Because it was free. Because it was free. Or down to Cork or whatever. Just for the day, just for the crack. Yeah. And that's how people's behaviour would change. Yeah. Right? So, but, so, but, uh, so think about it. So it's unbelievably feasible to do this right now. Okay. That's the most important thing. I'll just give you one more interesting this little interesting vignette about how little this would cost in real, real terms yeah. by using the bond market assiduously and taking advantage of the fact that interest rates are incredibly low at the moment. Because the interesting thing about a bond is you issue the bond, you, the issuer, gets all the money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the dirty little secret is, you know, bonds are never paid back. So you just pay the interest every year, then you pay the big lump sum at the end. But the dirty little secret is nobody ever pays them back. They're rolled over. So there's almost no government has paid back principal on their debt. Right. Isn't that amazing? They just really? don't pay it. Really? Like yeah, they just don't pay it. They just roll it over all the time. You roll it over. And the longer out the yield curve you are, the easier it is to roll the whole stuff over. Right? <laughs> right. Okay. Unless there's a massive crisis and you're faced with, you know, 10% interest rates at that time that you've got to roll over your yeah. maturing debt. So right? why, so if that's the case, why do people worry about debt then? Because people equate state debt to personal debt. And we all worry about personal debt because it rolls over very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the servicing costs. But what we really think about, if you think about mortgages, people don't really worry about outstanding amount of mortgage once they've taken it. It's the monthly repayment. 
Well, true. How actually, yeah. people worry about yeah. if that were to go up and down or up and down, right? In the bond market case, and the mortgage is an interesting example. So, in the mortgage case, right, you take out a thirty-year mortgage. Let's say it's five four hundred grand, right? But that's the debt side of the equation. Yeah. But you have an asset on the other side of the balance sheet called yeah. the house, and if that asset goes up in value, or if you live in it, the utility you get from living in it, the, the joy you get from living in it, that is what you get back. So just focus on the debt side means you're blind to both sides of the balance sheet. You have to look at the other side of the balance sheet. Okay, yeah, yeah. So in the same way, public transport or public investment or whatever, yes, you borrow money to build wind turbines, but in the end, you have the wind turbines. Right? And, they're so that, and they're functional. And that's, they're functional. That's, yeah. and that's the asset, yeah, right? Yeah. Same thing with public transport. Yes, you take out the debt, but you're buying buses. Yeah. And you're buying trains, and they are functional assets. So you always have to look at both sides of the, of the equation. And right now, I'll give you just a little... Last week... Remember we talked about the fact the Irish government raised 12 billion more euros than they expected to do, yes, right? Yeah. So imagine taking even 1 billion of that windfall. 1 billion of that windfall. Now this is mad when you get your head around. If you were to ring fence that 1 billion yeah. to pay for the servicing of the green bond to make public transport free in Ireland, that 1 billion would do you for 151 years wow. of payment, of your interest rate payments on your bond. So that's the reality of where we right. are. That's, that's, well, that's really, okay. So, well, then so, let me ask so, you So then. think about that. that that's, that's mad. No, actually, yeah. no, it's 100, no, it's 151 years, yeah. So you could, you could finance 151 years of free public transport in Ireland from 1 billion of the 12 billion windfall tax that we earned last year that we didn't expect. Yeah. It's mad. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. But okay, ju just let me ask you then that there's there's going to be pushback in some yeah, sectors. The, the car sector. Okay, talk to me about the politics of all of this. Then. Well, well, it's interesting. You know, if you think about the centre parties in Ireland, right? They really, really need a big new idea. Mm. They really need a big new idea. Now, you mentioned Charlie High. Right? I did. Right? <laughs> there are many people, elderly people that we know, we're old enough to remember, that many elderly people would be asked, when, particularly when oh, he was a flamboyant, corrupt yeah. Yeah. geezer, and it was so obvious, right? And you'd say to them, why did you vote for Charlie High? You know, the people say, I yeah. can't believe you voted for Charlie Rogue. Yeah, yeah. No, but loads of them says, he gave us the bus pass. That's true, yeah. He gave us the bus pass, yeah. all right? So you give something to people and they remember it. How oh, he was trading off that when he was buying his Charvet shirts. <laughs> he was getting working class folk to vote for him up in Artane on the back of the bus pass. Yeah. Right? So people do remember. So I think a big idea, you know, the centre parties are being outgunned on the left by the Shinners, for example, on the issue of housing. So you think, you know, if you're in power now, what do you do that's kind of cost free and benefits everyone? You introduce free public transport. And there is going to be a groundswell of support for you from left and right because you're hitting the biggest issue of the day, which is climate change. But rather doing... You know, the whole debate about climate change is what's it going to cost us? You know, it's yeah, always yeah, the thing. Yeah. Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for it? Yeah. You say, actually, we're going to be really good on climate change and we're giving it to you for free. Like, think about it. Yeah. These things, politics... It's a bit of a win-win. I think it's win-win. And also the funny thing is, it is the future. It is the future. This is, like, this is going to happen. Free public transport is going to be seen as the norm in the same way as free schooling is seen as the norm. Yeah. Right? Had you said in the 50s that we're going to introduce free public schooling, people said, oh, no, my God, it's going to cost us a fortune. And you wouldn't do that. Now it's the complete norm. And free public transport will be the norm as well. And of course, you could pay this measly six or seven million, but you could, you could expand it to 10 million because you expand the bus fleet or whatever, or the train fleet. The revenue from the congestion charge will pay you times over. Yeah. So the whole thing makes complete sense. But I come back to the basic idea. If we want to achieve climate change targets, we need to execute a profound change in public behavior. If we want to change public behavior, we have to reward people for changing their behavior. Yes. If you want to reward people, you make those rewards material, not small. So it's not like you're going to save a five or a week. 
Yeah. You're going to save loads of money. And we're going to say, but if you want to continue polluting with your cars and congesting and clogging up the world, well, you're going to pay for that. So what do you want? So you give people the autonomy to make the decisions for themselves. But ultimately, and this is the real thing, is that urban transport needs to shift lots and lots of individuals from cars to buses or trains. That's it. There's no other way out. And people say, yeah, but it's going to happen sooner or later. But later isn't an option. Yeah. It has to happen sooner. So it has to happen now. And then finally, this could go back to our discussion with the Norwegians a while ago, place you like and you are. Yeah, indeed. What they've said is that one of the greatest, greatest polluters in the economy, the two biggest polluting sectors are construction and transport. Mm. What you say to the heads of CIE and Dublin Bus and all those places, now you have a budget and you've got to look after costs and services and efficiencies and all that sort of stuff, right? But we're also going to give you the carbon budget. So you have to preside over the switching of all your vehicles to electric. Yeah. So you take away the angst of revenue from the management of raising money, but you give them the concern of reducing carbon emissions and you win in both ways. So transport then moves from being one of the biggest polluters to one of the most significant solutions to the problem of pollution. And you've fixed everything, or not everything, but you've gone a long, long way to fixing your number one problem, which is climate change. Just a quick message. Listen, thank you so much to all our Patreons. We couldn't do this without your support. And if you fancy supporting us and getting all sorts of fantastic gear, economic courses, tutorials, reading lists, all that jazz, follow us on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams.